Uh, first things first, thanks very much for, for joining the session this morning or today, should I say, depending on where you are in the world, um, uh, where we'll be exploring um, adapting the British asset indices methodology um, with a view for non-UK electrical asset owners. Um, so just a very quick introduction from me. I'm Chris Given. I'm strategic bid manager here at uh, EA Technology. Um, we also have joining us today uh, Joanne Peacock, who um, I've noticed there's some uh, some uh, names that are recognised on, on the call today. You will be familiar with Joanne. Uh, Joanne heads up our uh, asset investment management team, um, where we support businesses with asset investment planning uh, through our Invest software and a range of associated consultancy services. Um, as many of you will, will be aware, Joanne's been uh, guiding us through a series of these webinars um, over recent months where we've been exploring a range of topics, uh, essentially in support of asset health and risk modelling. Um, so uh, just the agenda for uh, today's session, um, we will be um, providing a, an overview of the, the common methodology, uh, what it is and, and the history of its development. Um, we'll be uh, providing a, a deconstruction of the methodology elements and we'll be looking at how uh, asset health, probability of failure and consequences of failure can be adapted for, for non-UK DNO environments. Um, we anticipate the, the, the session uh, will be around about 45 minutes for, for the main presentation and hopefully we'll have uh, 10, 15 minutes for uh, questions and answers at the end. Um, equally, if you do have uh, questions uh, throughout the, the session, if you'd like to pop them in the chat and we'll, we'll, we'll look to try and pick those up as we go through. Um, so trusting that all sounds OK with everybody, I'll hand you over to Joanne to, uh, to get us going. Thanks very much. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, yes, so good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, you see one or two colourful backgrounds. Um, <laughs> oh no, the colourful backgrounds have gone. <laughs> so uh, let's, uh, let's carry on. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. <laughs> Oh, oh, my apologies to jump in, Joanne. Uh, just uh, yeah, housekeeping. Um, the session will be recorded just to let you know. Apologies, I should have mentioned that at the start. Sorry, Joanne. Sure, no problem. OK, um, right. So let, let's move on and have a look at the overview of the common um, network asset indices methodology. Um, I recognise lots of faces. I know sort of where several of you um, are working and, and there is obviously quite a lot of familiarity with um, common um, methodology um, within the people who are attending. So uh, hopefully this will be um, just a, a way of progressing through the methodology and adapting that methodology to suit um, your local environment. Um, so I apologise if I go over things that people already already are, are aware of. Right, so common methodology then. Um, so what is it? So essentially it's a methodology for assessing the health and criticality of electricity distribution assets. So in the UK, um, it, it's designed for the UK or, or Great Britain. Um, so that's distribution assets, everything from LV all the way up to 132 kV assets. Um, it predicts the future state of assets. Um, it was developed in 2015-16 um, by the GB distribution network operators um, and we work with the companies um, to do that. It was based on a methodology called uh, CBRM or Condition Based Risk Management which we developed and all the network operators were using at that particular time. In 2021 we had an update to version um, 2.1 and so Everything in the rest of this presentation relates to that version 2.1, um, although there are some subtle differences between um, that and, and the previous version. I don't think there's anything um, particularly new that we'll go into today. Um, the network operators produced common methodology because they were um, required to as part of a standard license condition from the regulator and they use the um, the outputs of the methodology for business planning and also for that uh, regulatory reporting. 
So I've put a link on there to version two of the methodology. Um, and if you've seen my previous uh, webinars, I have actually done um, a webinar on common methodology and some of those differences between version one and version two. So the question is, is it relevant to me if I'm not a GB DNO? Um, it's not a standard methodology and um, there's a misconception that it's it's a standard global methodology it's not it was designed by the network operators to serve a purpose within their organizations that is regulatory reporting and the assessment of asset health condition and risk um, they were motivated to do precisely that they weren't motivated to produce a global standard methodology there are some working groups, CGRE working groups, ISO working groups, looking at other methodologies, and I'm sure in time they will turn into um, relevant papers and, and documents and standards. But at the minute, common methodology is the, the most practical and I guess simple methodology that network operators globally have sort of picked up and thought, can we use this within our organisations? And the answer is probably yes. Um, so it contains we proven principles um, structures mechanisms for determining asset health and criticality um, the way that the methodology is constructed it's the same for every asset class almost um, and it's it it contains basic um, linkage uh, around the methodology at the standard format um, standard algorithms and things and so we can adapt those out the methodology to um, a different environment which is exactly what we're talking about in this webinar today. Um, the history of the the methodology so it goes back for, to CBRM which was conceived um, sort of around about 2000 but that has been developed for quite a number of years um, and so the algorithms behind the methodology are, are proven um, not just in the UK but in companies around the world including sort of Australia and New Zealand um, and sort of other um, countries so if you want to know how to age assets if you want to know how to get the probability of failure from the health um, if you want to understand you know DGA and things like that then it's all in it's all in the methodology it has been designed to be relatively simple um, so you need a basic level of information just to get going and then every additional data point that you add um, adds um, you can have further confidence in the results that that methodology is is providing um, but even if you don't have even if you have a low base of data which is what a lot of the GB operators started with then it's it's something and you can look at the gaps and you can look at strategically how to backfill the gaps and again we've done um, webinars on that particular subject so deviation from common is no longer deviation from the methodology is, is no longer a common methodology so once you do start adapting it you can't quite benchmark your um, results against the network operators in in the UK um, in in the UK we're very good at, at publishing a lot of our results through the Ofgem websites and uh, the network operators also do that through business plans and other other documents and things so we have quite an open um, approach to sort of information sharing in terms of the, the results and things um, but you won't quite be able to take your results once you've adapted it um, to, to match exactly um, but you can sort of see how how you do align um, on a more sort of general level um, yeah a couple of other bits on there and um, so it's designed to be common so it doesn't allow for nuances in fleets um, asset fleets so if you did adapt the common methodology if you're if you're not after commonality um, then it doesn't have any of the nuances and, and the network operators in the UK certainly accept that to be common they can't they can't have any special cases um, so it's it's one of the reasons why it's more simple um, and then obviously we've got adaptations um, which we will discuss so this is just a quick um, timeline just showing you how common methodology fits in um, with CBRM condition-based risk management and also where it's going next so as part of the 
license conditions, the network operators need to continue to update the common methodology. Um, and currently we were, we've got a working group with the GB DNOs where we're doing just that and we're talking about what would common methodology three look like. Um, so the way that's progressing is that we're unlikely to do anything significant to the current sets of asset classes that are in there. They're probably going to stay as is, except for um, there's a submarine asset, a submarine cables asset class that will change a little bit. Um, there will be some new and adapted calibrations, but substantially that's going to be the same. In the UK, we've got 61 asset classes that we look at, and there's a desire to move more to around about 104 um, asset classes or towards that that end that range. Um, CNN covers about three quarters of the assets that um, network operators own currently. Um, so there's a desire to increase that. Um, but with that, that will mean that we start looking at some right. different model structures to cater for assets where there's low volumes of data. Um, and low confidence in data. So we might be looking at things like population-based um, models for some of those, and we might be tackling some of the other asset classes, which are just a little bit more challenging. Um, so that's where we're going with CNAME 3, um, but there won't be a webinar on that for a little while because it's, it's, quite, it's quite new. Um, but as you can see, CNAME 3 won't come into play until 2028. Um, so, the network operators need to start planning for that now. So we need to start having a methodology worked up in around about a year to 18 months to give them time to get all their processes in order to collect any data that they need to collect, to embed it with all the, their sort of other reporting and IT systems and things. So it's a really long process that they're going through. Um, so they're starting to do that sort of essentially now, although they will run out of time um, to be confident in whatever CNAME 3 looks like ready for 2028. Um, that gives you an idea of their kind of planning cycle. OK, um, so how is the methodology used? Um, so every asset in a, in a fleet um, gets a health score um, and a probability of failure and ultimately a HI number, so HI 1 to 5. It also gets a criticality value, um, so consequences of failure, and that translates into a, a, a sort of broad scale of 1 to 4. And then those 1 to 4 and 1 to 5 are plotted on a grid square, as we've got on the screen. And so what the ultimate output um, is the volumes of assets in each of the grid squares. And for net, for business planning, the network operators produce that um, for the current point in time, um, for the future point in time, which is the end of the regulatory cycle, and for the end um, point with investments. And the, um, the regulator will look at how much um, money they're asking for and whether that um, change in the matrix represents good, good value for money. Um, so that's the sort of the end point um, and they declare these volumes and things um, throughout the regulatory period and they look at things like the, the movements within the matrix as we go along doing the annual reporting um, and they must um, meet the numbers which they said that they're going to do otherwise there are penalties for doing so. Okay so now we're going to look at the actual methodology itself. So I've tried to split the methodology and it, it's worth thinking about it in these three parts. So you have the asset data, so all your lists of assets and the data that belongs to those assets are sort of in one group. And then in another group, you have data which is used to, um, we call it calibration data. So it's settings and configuration data. And that is applied to every asset um, within um, a fleet population and then we've got the algorithms um, which are obviously our operations and they bring together the calibration data and the asset data and so different parts of where you will adapt the methodology for your own use um, will look at these different these different elements 
And so as we go through, I've tried to put those on the screen where they, they are affected. So this is the common methodology structure. So I'm sure it's probably familiar to a lot of people on the call. So on the left hand side, we've got everything to do with the asset health. And then on the right hand side, we've got everything to do with the consequences of failure. And then ultimately, we've got this risk matrix which drops out at the end. So this this five by four HICI matrices. So that's pretty much standard for every every asset class in the fleet. Um, the methodology, when you explore that, it goes down and it looks at a whole range of detail. And obviously, each of those blocks in the prior diagram can be exploded out to see um, a range of other inputs and things coming through. Um, and everything is very prescriptive down to what we call the sort of nuts and bolts level. Um, this level, which has got um, all the inputs specified in, in this orange colour and then in the white boxes, you've got those algorithms and then um, in the blue boxes, you've sort of got the calibration data. Um, OK, and then the methodology also specifies exactly what all of these algorithms actually are. Um, so you can put them into a spreadsheet or you can put them into a sort of software package and things um, and calculate your own um, methodology, which I'm sure um, has gone on in, in lots of the organisations of people that are on the call. Um, so that's what everything contains. The data inputs, as you notice, um, they're very prescribed. So this is for the HV primary switch gear that's on the screen. Um, so we have every asset class has a whole list of data points and then a whole list of allowable values. So we can take precisely these values and these values only for um, each of these data points. And that's not to say that the GB network operators will collect only these data points or precisely these allowable values for these data points. Um, but if they don't, they will need to convert whatever data that they are collecting into these allowable values for it to be used in the methodology. And so a lot of the, a lot of the models we've built for our customers include what we call a mapping layer or a translation layer that translates their sort of raw data into the format ready for common methodology. We also have prescribed um, calibration values. So as we adapt um, the methodology, some of these you may want to change and some of them um, you might want to leave the same and we'll talk about which um, fall into each category. Um, but everything is prescribed within that methodology. OK, so if we go on to talk about adapting asset health. Um, so this was everything on the left hand side. So age, location, duty, um, health score modifier and reliability. We'll step through those um, in this section. So first of all, the, the first part of the process um, is to get uh, what we call an initial health index to calculate an initial health index. And to do that, we use the age and the duty and the location factor um, from these um, these three boxes on screen. Um, we also use what we call a normal expected life and we set that per asset class. And so the methodology itself specifies 25 health index asset categories. So these are the sort of broad asset categories and then we divide each of those into one or more um, subcategories and they're called asset register categories. And as I mentioned a little bit before, there are 61 of those and I've just put some of those on screen so you can get an idea of, of what those actually are. And so for the age and then expected life, so the age is based on the asset um, manufacturer date. Um, if you don't have that, it could be an installation date. Um, or another date associated with um, knowing how old that asset actually is. For the expected life, um, this is where you would set the time in years, and this is um, the definition that's given by the methodology itself. So it's the time in years in an asset's life when it would be expected to first observe significant deterioration. So on a health score scale, which goes from 0 0.5 to 10, um, we're looking at a health score of 5.5 and that takes into consideration the type or, or 
the location or duty, which is the workload of the asset, in addition to the asset type. So the first thing you'll notice in terms of adaptation on here then is that you are potentially not going to have the same assets um, as the common methodology. Um, so your voltages might be different and your, diff your asset types might be different. Um, so there's some work to do there initially to map your asset classifications into the list of classifications that we see uh, at a sort of broad range and then also at a detailed level. So immediately, right at the very beginning, we are starting to, to make some adaptations, but hopefully you can start to see where your assets would fit within these classifications. In terms of expected life, um, normal expected life set by the methodology, which is also on screen, a little portion of it, um, everything from sort of 25 years all the way up to 100 years is set as expected lives. So switchgear and transformers tend to be around 50 to 60 years or 40 to 60 years. Um, Odd things tend to be a little bit lower. So for example, in common methodology two, we start to see um, on the wood poles that's on the screen, we've got um, this water soluble copper salt treated um, poles and they've only got a 25 year period. Um, it's probable that you don't have that type of, of pole. Um, that's a new addition for common methodology two and it just shows how um, network operators tried treating some poles with a particular solution and that didn't work because it caused some rot underground and so they've adapted the methodology to take account for, for that. Um, so where you haven't got um, poles then you you know these types of poles you'll need to make adjust adjustments um, and again they, your asset classes won't necessarily fit into the GB ones. The thing that's worth remembering at this point um, is that when we start banding up um, into our health index bands, um, so this is HI1 to 5, these are the CNAME2 bands, so they're slightly different from CNAME1, and you'll see that an asset with no condition data, the maximum score it can achieve is a 5.5, and that's also what we're setting as our normal expected life point. Um, and that that is exactly a HI3. So the HI3 band is quite narrow. Um, so it's just worth bearing in mind that that's the point that when you start changing your normal expected lives, that's the point that you want to start start looking at. In terms of duty, um, so you might not want to change duty um, particularly. Um, the duty is based on the workload of the asset and it's generally um, things like the, the loading or numbers of operations or, or, or the voltages. Um, you might choose the, for your equivalent assets to keep them almost like, like for like with common methodology. So we're sort of suggesting you could get away with not changing um, the duty factor unless you have duty that's extremely, you know, much, I, I guess, assessed to be different from the UK. As with all of these factors, the normal position um, is that a factor of one, um, so it translates to a factor of one. So we have these allowable values um, for each of our assets, and then the factor um, is associated with that, and that's the factor that's used within the methodology, essentially as a multiplier. So where there might be slightly slight differences or you want to change the banding, is that um, you feel that your assets are under a different workload than our GB assets. So you can see from this distribution transformer example that our normal situation of um, percent utilisation and normal loading is 70 to 100 percent. So that gives us a factor of one. Um, so if that's not the case, then you want to be careful about changing the potentially the normal expected life and also um, these factors to align with that so you want the normal position um, for your assets on your network under your operating conditions. Next we look at the location factor. Um, so in the UK we have standard inputs which are distance from coast, altitude and corrosion. Um, I've put the UK map on here with the corrosion zones. So our corrosion zones come from um, 
the galvanizers association um it's unlikely that um it, that's only uk based so you would have to pick up some other measure of corrosion or pollution and things like that um from where uh, you are located You'll also see that because we're quite a small nation and we have a lot of coastline, distance from coast is quite relevant to us. Um, but obviously, if you're in a much bigger country, then um, you might want to adapt the distance from coast. Um, input and again, the altitude, um, again, that's something that's relevant in the UK. It might not be quite as relevant wherever you are. Um, so it is possible that you will have to make some adaptations to your local environment you you might have other challenges um you know we've as we've sort of traveled we've seen challenges relating to sort of um sort of wind direction and things like that especially for things like affecting overhead lines and stuff um so it is quite common to um, change those inputs for the location factor if you do that, you'll be affecting the data um, as well as the calibration um, settings for those. There's also in the UK, we've got submarine cables. Um, there's a whole sort of almost methodology relating to the location factor of um, submarine cables. Um, it's a bit too niche to sort of go into that on this call, but it's worth having a look at, at what those are. But essentially, it's looking at the topography and how the cables are laid and whether it's in a tidal or, or like on a lake and things like that and then we've got now we're going to move on and have a look at the reliability modifier um so the reliability modifier um is almost the only open point within the gb methodology where they can put other things in that don't fit elsewhere and they can do that as long as they justify why they put something in there so it accepts two inputs so a factor and a what we call a collar and the collar sets a minimum value of the health um, irrespective of everything else that's gone on so the factors hover around one so if you're putting in a factor of, of one that kind of doesn't do anything um, but obviously if you've got problematic types of equipment this is where you might want to reflect it and if you want to get rid of particular equipment as long as you can justify why that's the case then the most effective way of using this is to put in a collar um, and as you can see the most common collar are the points at which um, we've got this lower limit of the health score so collars of eight will automatically push an asset into a health score or hi5 category so when you're setting these you need to to bear that in mind so that also means that if you do decide to change your health index banding you will also need to potentially change the colors you're using um, as you as you go through the methodology in terms of observed and measured conditions we're sort of suggesting that there's no change on this um, unless you have so you could change this to match your condition inspections so that is is possible if you do that you will have to set whole new um criteria so this is just one input from um hv switchgear so the allowable values we have listed and we have a description of those allowable values and each one has a factor a cap and a collar so the caps just set the maximum health um, for that particular input um, and that's used quite rarely but we do use the collars quite a lot so in this case for this um, external condition if you have substantial deterioration that's a collar of eight so that's automatically in that hi5 bucket alternatively so you can so you can change all of this um, but if you want to keep it as close as possible to common you would then have one of those mapping layers potentially that I talked about earlier and you would translate your current raw data into this format the other thing that the network operators in GB have done um, and it's just about being published at the minute is produce what we call this good practice guide and the good practice guide goes through the methodology and it looks at each of these observed conditions and measure conditions and it's got a photographic guide um, and so for each condition criteria so this one is superficial 
um, stroke minor deterioration. It will have a photo of an asset or various assets and it will have an explanation as to exactly why that asset is in that particular condition criteria. So this is a useful exercise to improve the quality of the data collection inspections and so this is what is expected in terms of the commonality of that particular data point. If you've used common methodology version one, you'll see a change in um, just these observed condition labelling. So originally version one, I think, had um, we had the um, normal condition, normal, normal wear, I think was one of the data points. I think that was um, then replaced with the superficial minor. And that's just because normal wear for a brand new asset it, it, you know, is different from normal wear for an asset which is say 30 years old and so people were interpreting what they meant by normal wear um, when they did the condition inspections and so that's why we've sort of got a change in language and also this good practice guide um, and like I say this is in the process of being published um, in the UK and this will be on our ENA website um, and if you um, if you want we can we can point you in the direction of that when that is it's actually published um, but that's that's a good it's a good guide um, it's a useful one so then adapting so that's all the health stuff um, that you'll need to change so anything I've not talked about is generally considered to be the same so all the algorithms and everything um, generally we would suggest keeping the same as common methodology so now we move on and look at the probability of failure so in common methodology, we've got sort of defined failure rates which are um, used for each asset class um, and that is across all of the network operators and um, we use the same ones. But if you're using the methodology, you'll want to potentially change the, um, the, the failure rate to suit your own particular environment. So as an offline exercise, um, there's a process that you'll go through to look at those condition based failures. So excluding ones caused by um, external damage or weather conditions and things, and then take all those condition ones and then attribute them into what we call failure modes. So the common failure modes are catastrophic, degraded and incipient. Um, and I put a description of each of those. And then for each of the asset classes, We've also got um, a distribution of how those failure modes occur. So that's quite different depending on um, which asset class is which. And then also the likely cost of the different failures um, for those failure modes. So like I say, this has been an, an offline exercise. In terms of the formula for the asset health, um, we've got um, this cubic formula which um, I'm not going to explain at this particular um, in this particular um, junction but um, it's fair to say that when you've got your failure rate um, you then need to turn it into this value called k to fit into the methodology and k is used as a multiplier into this cubic equation and I've got a quick sort of diagram of how that works so once you have all your asset health, um, you can plot them on a our probability of failure um, curve and then define your overall known probability of failure. And then what the K value does is it multiplies up and it matches the assets onto that onto that um, probability of failure um, onto that failure rate um, curve. So we're looking at um, applying that algorithm. Um, for every asset in the in the population. But first we need to determine what the value of K is. And I've done this very simply, um, just as an example. Um, just excuse me, excuse me a second. Apologies, I've got a cold and <laughs> I just needed to blow my nose. Um, okay, so K explained very quickly. Um, so we, if we have all of our assets listed out um, and we have the current health score, then 
we actually have a flat bottom to our health, um, our, our probability of failure curve, as we sort of seen in the previous diagram. And so all the assets up to a value of um, a health score of four have the same probability of failure. So for ease of calculation, I've just created a column which is the health score for calculating the relative probability of failure. So if the health score is less than or equal to four, we just get a value of four, else we get a value which is greater than four. And then from there, we can apply what we call a relative probability of failure. So that is our cubic part of the equation. And then from there, we can define um, what K is using the following process. So if you have an average number of failures per annum, this is across all of your failure modes, and say that is five. And then C value is another constant in our algorithm. This sets the um, the sort of the shape of the curve, so the steepness of the curve. And in common methodology, that's always 1.087. And so the average numbers of failures per annum is K multiplied by the sum of these, uh, the cubic equation. Um, so let's move on a bit. So this part, um, which is highlighted, is the relative probability of failure. And so K then is the average number of failures per annum um, over the sum of the relative probability of failure. And so when we apply the relative probability of failure, we can sum all of those up and we can do that equation to get our value of K. Um, I know that was a bit quick. Hopefully that makes, hopefully that makes sense. Um, but essentially just using spreadsheet, you can easily calculate that value. And so another sort of quick check is that um, if you then apply K times the relative probability of failure, then once you sum all of those up as well, you should get the number you first, you first came to. So that's um, calculating K. Um, so then we'll just move on and look at adapting consequences of failure. So again, back to our common methodology structure. So on the right hand side, we've got all of our consequence categories. And the way that the methodology um, defines these is that for every consequence category, we have a reference cost of failure, which is the average per population. Um, and then we have a criticality factor. And this tells us how important each asset is so if you have no criticality information, every asset will be exactly the same as every other asset, and it will be the same as the reference consequence of failure. So back in terms of the banding, so criticality banding this time. So to get our criticalities, um, an average asset with say 100% the same as average, um, it will be a C2 band. So everything 75% to 125% of the average um, will be a C2. Less important assets will be a C1 and more important assets will be a C3 and a C4. So again, if you're looking at changing these bandings, you'll need to bear that in mind um, when you're changing calibration values. For network performance, um, there are two mechanisms specified. Um, and because we're dealing with network assets, um, these are linked to the regulatory environment in which we work. So LV and HV assets, so that's assets up to 11 kV, or actually up to 20 kV, so 11, 20 kV. Um, we use CMLs and CIs, or SADI safety numbers, um, to and, and we use the first algorithm that I've put on the screen. So obviously your SADI safety numbers are going to be different to our CML CI values. So there is calibration to be done um, and settings to be changed there to align with that particular methodology. Um, the, for EHV and 132KV, we assume that there is redundancy. And so it uses this loss load method um, and I've just cut the word off there, so loss of security. And we use the network type, um, so that is um, whether there is redundancy or not. There are a small number of assets without um, some redundancy. We also look at the maximum demand of that particular asset, and we look at the asset register category in terms of um, things like getting that asset back um, available again um, 
if in the event of a failure and that uses the second second algorithm so of all the of all the consequence categories this is the one where you'll need to apply your own uh, calibration to these um, to the inputs coming in if you're not a not network company then these two mechanisms might not be sufficient to reflect um, the effective operation of an asset and so where we've worked with um, industrial type customers or other other types of customers um, then we have actually changed this for a different a different mechanism um, depending on how the assets are are operated for safety um, the data inputs we look for a safety type and safety location um, so safety type can be things like um, like insulation medium and, and that kind of thing um, safety location is usually related to how close that asset is to a populated area and I put some of the definitions on here um, from the actual methodology and the um, the algorithm itself so again this is a, a calibration that you will potentially want to change um, so once you look in the methodology you'll see that our calibration values relate to um, the value of investment to prevent injury or the loss of life um, and we have used values um, from the transport industry so government type values and we've also got what we call a disproportion factor which is a factor that multiplies that up um, because we're saying that as an electricity industry we are very responsible and take safety concerns very seriously so we increase that value by a particular amount so that our cost of investment to prevent injury or loss of life is actually far exceeding um, what is sort of mandated or required um, so that's how we've done it in the UK but obviously attitudes to um, investment and, and safety do do change um, so if you haven't got any other references then common methodology safety is, is a good place to start for the environment again we've taken a similar approach and again environment concerns are different um, depending on where you go but if you haven't got any other reference values then looking at the common methodology reference values is also a good place to start so for the inputs we're looking for the asset inputs we're looking at the type um, the size of the asset and again the environment and in particular for the environment this time we're looking at the proximity to water course and in particular where you've got oil assets oil filled assets the possibility of leakage out into um, water courses that's probably the most significant um, aspect of of environment um, but we also look at things like waste and loss of SF6 and there's some values that are put in the methodology as calibration values um, to reflect those things as well for financial um, this is essentially the um, recovery of an asset once it's failed and we specify that based on the different um, failure modes so this incipient degraded and catastrophic and as a guide um, the reference cost we've got for catastrophic is the up to the full value of the asset for degraded it's up to 25 percent of the asset and for incipient failures it's up to 10 percent so again this can be quite useful as a gauge for when you're looking at your failure analysis and putting that into um, your different failure mode types and getting your different volumes so for financial we're looking at the proportion of failures that are within each of these asset um, in each of these failure modes and we're looking at the likely costs and obviously those costs are going to be different in the UK compared to um, where you are located and so for the reference cost of failure then um, what I've done here is just shown you um, how the reference costs change for different assets so this top table um, just shows you straight from the methodology where the different proportions of, of failures are from the exact numbers and then I've actually taken those and converted those into percentages for different um, asset types 
So you'll find that um, different types have a higher bias towards different consequence categories. So fittings, um, so this is um, steel tower fittings and a lot of the LV assets. Um, safety is the one that comes up as the most um, prominent um, contributor to those consequences of failure. Um, for others, it's financial. Um, for some, it's environment, but only really the cables, the oil fill cables are the ones which um, we have the, the highest driver um, are the environment um, considerations. For network performance, this is generally more balanced, um, but switch gear tends to come out sort of slightly higher there. Um, and then you've got other asset classes where you've got sort of broader sort of range. So LV boards, 31% uh, financial, 36 for safety and net performance is, is 33. Um, the environment is, is not is not zero. It's just it's um, it's a very it's a very low number. But generally, environment tends to come out the lowest. Um, and then it usually tends to be safety, but then the financial and um, network performance um, tend to be sort of similar. So it might be useful to look at these percentages and wh when you are doing your calibration, see whether you agree with that and whether you want to get somewhere close to aligning with common methodology. Um, and that might be one of the ways of, of doing that. So that's all of the all of the slides that I wanted to to go through. Um, I hope that was that was useful. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Oh, thanks, John. Uh, Srini here from Energy Queensland. Um, yeah, we attended um, the previous ones as well. So um, yeah. we, we have already applied the CNIM um, concept um, in our um, um, health index profile and also the risk monetization profile. Um, so when we used what act, like exactly said in CNAME and what the adapted, uh, I would say calibrated to the Australian yeah. environment, um, the, the answer is vastly different. So for example, conductor, um, we used a C name, um, just didn't touch anything. We just used just C name, and it comes out like I need to do 6,000 kilometer per year. Um, and when I calibrate it to the Australian environment, it comes out to 2,000 kilometer per year. So it's a it's a difference because like like you said, just for every others in this meeting as well, saying your expected life is is it's prescribed by the UK of gem saying for this type of conductors, you have to take 50, 60, 70 expected years or something. We changed it because we changed it to yeah. what the, our experience. The coastal, as you said, we your factor was two for less than five kilometer. If we put two, it's going to kill every cable. So mm -hmm. we, we can't put that much amount of um, um, factor in there. So, so my question is towards once you swayed away from this CNAM numbers, which is, in my view, CNAM is the, the benchmarking um, tool for off them. So every DNSPs in UK use the same number. So they can put everyone in the same plate and they can compare. Yeah. So, am I right? Yeah. And so that's the reason they were providing the reference cost of the failure. So, for example, LV pole is 500 bucks for. 500 pounds for safety and those sort of things. Um, but obviously Australia doesn't have one. The AEI is never go, uh, not going to do it right now, but they might do it in, in future. But once you swayed away from every one of these things, so, so we swayed away from expected life, we, we away from the calibration factor, and we are away from this um, reference cost of failure because we took our likelihood, we are our consequence, everything. Can you still call it that we are using CNAME? Because CNAME is common network asset indices yes. methodology. And I think, I, I personally think I cannot call myself CNAME. The, the, the formulas of 
using the like um, I'm using to come up with a health index model. Yes, there's a formula is there, and we use the C name formula, which is used to be the old circuit, um, CBRM formula. We, we didn't change that. But every factors in it, the calibration factors, the dollar reference and everything, it's completely different. Yeah. So, so what's what's your view on it? Can can I still say to if I go to AER, I'm I'm going to AER in next month, but can I go and tell them I'm using C name? Um, I think I think I would use slightly different language. Hmm. I, I think that um, I would tend to say that you, I would use I'm using a C name type or C name style methodology. Yeah. So that is based on C name. Um, so yeah. you can say, ba and, and it's funny, but, um, Chris and I had quite some debate over the naming of this webinar. <laughs> so <laughs> um, you can, yeah, so I can't remember what we quite uh. landed on now, but um, you can say it's based on the British standard C name mm. methodology adapted mm. for the Australia environment. And I would mm. tend to label it like that because you still want to have that reference to the fact that you're using what is a standard, even though it's not mm. a standard in Australia, and you're still using a lot of the same algorithms, the same structures and, f and formulas. You've just adapted that into um, something that then mm. um, is, and, and this is why I've separated out those, you know, those calibrations as a chunk. So. It's, it's a useful way of thinking about it. So you've got the asset data and you've got or mostly the same asset data. You've got mostly the same algorithms, but you've got this different with the calibrations. And so you mm. can't call it sort of it's not C name, but it's C name style or C name type. Yeah. Um, but as, as you've realized that probably something that I should have mentioned is that it's really useful to go through the methodology parts, starting from the age expected life and then working down towards, you know, duty location and your observed conditions. Mm. And the normal process that we would do that, and I'm sure you've done the same as you've changed lots of things, is to go through and say, does this come up with the right values for the right factors? Does mm. this now reflect what's going on with our environment for our assets? And you're making those checks at each point, and then by the yeah. time you get to creating your health index, you're saying, you know, do our engineers agree that this reflects the condition of our assets? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, even by the time you get to the end where you're saying that you've got now 2,000 instead of 6,000 assets for replacement, is that, you know, do your engineers agree with that process? And yeah. is, is that the right thing? And, and we would look at things like assets that are coming out with low health scores, does that match mm. the data coming in? Can we follow that? Does that make sense? We look at assets in the middle. We look at things like young assets in poor condition, old assets in good condition. And you do those checks and measures at the end. And it's mm. by doing that that you'll understand that whether your calibration is is working or not. Um, and it's easy to do that with assets like transformers, where you've got potentially less of them, um, or taking a sample of you know, highly populated <laughs> assets like conductors or poles or something like that. Yeah. So it yeah. sounds like you've gone through the right processes mm. to get to your results. Yeah. And that's, so don't that's be disturbed. Why, that, that will be different from. Yeah. And that's why I used a CBRM slash C name principles. I just yeah. used both the name in my yeah. business case. So, you know, CBRM is well known with the Australian AER as well. So when I put C name there, they understand. And it's all derived from CBRM. So the C name is derived from. Just one last question. Your refer um your critical banding, especially on the criticality side. I understand your health index side. Just yeah. the criticality yeah. side. Um I I read it plenty of times, but I still couldn't understand it clearly. So I would better have another session or something regarding that, but I don't because you guys only have five minutes, but yeah. So yeah. like in a separate yeah. session or something, I, I'm happy to have that. Um, yeah, I mean, we could potentially do that next time in terms of looking at um, the critical. I mean, we could look at take a deeper dive at the the health index or the criticality side of them because I, I think this is webinar number seven now, and 
and I realise that I do only a very light touch on on those and um, yeah, a sort of deeper dive. I, I think um, just with regard to that banding, it the the banding between C name one and C name two has changed. Um, so if you're picking up both documents, you'll find that there are differences. Um, so what we did in C name one um, was we had we calculated all the consequences of failures for every asset in in a band for every asset and then we looked at we summed them up and, and well we created an average and so the average moved around according to the assets that came in so that might be how you've got your methodology set up um, and that also meant that the reference cost moved around a little bit um depend yeah. between the network operators in the uk when we moved to C name two, that changed. So we've got a fixed value mm. of a reference cost for an average reference cost is um, across the methodology now for each mm. net, for each asset category, yeah. which means that that banding doesn't change around. And so the network operators now compare to a fixed value. So that's been a little bit of a change between version one and version two. So if you're using version one, you might want to have a look at the mechanism for version two in that area. We're using version two. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> version two is actually easier. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Fine. Thank you. Thanks, Srini. Are there any other questions? Yeah, Joe. Hello. Yes. It's been a long time. Hi, Andrew. Um, <laughs> Uh, with the um, so looking at those additional asset classes for the, the version three, yeah, is there any thought about how uh, let's call it so modern assets, so like batteries um, and sort of the smart the smart grid type stuff, how that will be brought Ooh. into the fold? Um, batteries are certainly on the list. Um, I don't think much else. I think everything else are the more a more traditional asset. So. There's some backfilling of assets, um, so things like um, HVLV conductors are likely to be on that list. Um, I, I don't think we'll make everything on the list, just simply because it's sort of in the too hard to do bucket in terms of the data um, availability. And some assets are considered as sort of ancillary and not really assets in their own right so protection falls into that kind of group there's there's not significant um drive to produce something for for um uh, for protection equipment um potentially things like hvdc might make it in there i'm not entirely sure but there's from our initial analysis there's been five asset classes which are ones where we think will fit into the similar structure as the current common methodology and they include um, additional um, conductors potentially cables um, at the hvlb cables um chris can you remember what else was on that list there's certainly yeah. batteries on that list yeah, batteries is on there, yeah. um I'll, I'll find i'll find the five categories for you andrew if you like um, and yeah, then we've great. got some which are not definitely not going to be there and they include things like cutouts and service cables um, and then we've got this whole raft of things in the middle so things like 132 kv poles are not currently on the list but there's only tiny populations so we'll probably do those because they'll fit into one of the other groups that we've currently got um, so they will go in um, so there's a few groups like that um, yeah, I, I can probably provide some more information on what the categories are. Um, and yeah, maybe future webinars will be sort of what we're considering progressing. Um, but we're thinking about assets which are going to go into the traditional current formats and then assets which are potentially going to have a different format altogether. So that might be a population based. It might be a sort of condition only based or it might be something else. So we're looking at those as well. Cool. Thank you. Anything else? It's all maybe gone it's too late for maybe it's too late for Australia, six PM here. Everybody's working all the time. <laughs> sorry about that. Um 
so yeah so th that's it for slides um if you want to know anything about what else we do um obviously we've got our own software packages and we service the uk um and um other others with um our own software so in the slide pack you'll see a few diagrams about how we represent our assets within our software um and so just to close by saying Thank you very much um, for your attendance this morning. Um, I know everybody's going to be sort of Eastern um, for, from us, um, but if you are um, over this way, I don't know if we've got any European sort of um, representation, but we are going to be in Cyred in Rome in June um, 13th to 15th. Um, the next webinar will be the 28th of June. Um, we haven't um, decided exactly which uh, what we're going to do for that webinar, but um, we will communicate. We will make a decision over the next few days and communicate that out. But uh, I think your suggestions, Strini, of maybe doing a bit more of a, a sort of deep dive in in some of those areas, that's certainly been on mm -hmm. our our kind of list. But uh, if anybody's got any suggestions and preferences for that um, topics for the next or future webinars then please do shout up and and yeah get in touch with us and engage with us we'd be happy to have a chat anything else chris no uh, just uh thank you to uh to joanne as ever for uh for the, the presentation uh really informative and i'd like to also add uh she looks very fresh considering <laughs> she did a hundred mile run <laughs> at the weekend so uh yeah I wasn't well gonna done mention to Joanne that. <laughs> for doing a, a, a hundred mile ultra marathon uh, at the weekend and still well being alive <laughs> that's, that's a good enough win well done <laughs> it's a good enough win my little motivation for that is i have this I have this amazing little belt buckle um so it's a little gold belt buckle for my for my endeavors at the weekend <laughs> <laughs> if it was me, I must admit, Joanne, I'd expect more than a belt buckle for a hundred miles. But uh, yeah, congratulations. Banana as well. Awesome I got a banana. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that changes things then. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks very much, everyone. It's lovely to see you on the call this morning or this afternoon, evening, wherever you are. <laughs> Thanks, right. all. Thank Thanks you. Bye. 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 Bye.